So here we go. Now, next future. Uh, I'm an architect. I've been using BIM since 1993, so it was pretty early on that we got into it. One theme today is about connecting, sharing, and collaborating. And I think that you guys started that journey yesterday when you were looking at all the tools that are out there. But if you look at uh, back in time, 300,000 years ago, we were sitting around a fire and we had to connect with each other and we used the spoken language and we were able to share stories from the past and learn from them and go into the future. The technology of fire allowed us to gather like this. So the, the connectivity between people still exists. We still do this. Nothing has really changed. It's just that the, the technology and the tools have moved forward to be able to tell stories in different ways. And if you look at cities of today, there's amazing things going on. There's a ton of data and a ton of information. Uh, things are really moving really fast, and we have to be able to manage all this change and manage all the challenges that we have today in, in the 21st century. Um, as architect, the reason I got into this, I, I, I love the part about being innovating and being an artist and connect, connecting technologies and tools and coming up being creative. We have things in our heads. We have really great ideas in our heads. And what's frustrated me from the very beginning when I first got into BIM, I thought architects were going to move right into it in a couple of years. This was in 93. And now we're finally here. But I still think we have a long way to go. I think we have a lot of opportunity, but we have to be able to grasp it. It's great to create great architecture and great design, but how do we actually take that and move it into the 21st century as far as how we connect with people, how we connect with the environment, how we connect with cities? We still essentially are doing this, even with BIM today. So that's bad and it's also good. It means there's a lot of opportunity for change. Um, and one thing we have to do is break down the information silo. I don't know if any of you heard this term, but basically there's a lot of different tools and a lot of different processes that don't talk to each other, as we all know. And in this connected 21st century, if we don't break from one to the next, we really don't expand the value of information. We're in the information age. We produce a ton of information in the building industry. If we don't connect outward, our value stays down low in, in, this, in this new age. So how do we do that? <clears throat> the technology has existed for years to get on the internet, <clears throat> make a reservation, see a floor plan of a plane with seats changing in real time, and then you're able to buy that ticket, get a contract right on the spot. You don't go away and say, I'm going to print out today's schedule, fly from San Francisco, put it in a binder, put it on a shelf, or put it in a PDF file, come back two weeks later and expect to buy that flight. In the airline industry, there are very few mid-air collisions. In the building industry, there's still too many. <laughs> so that the, it's not the fact that the technology is not there. The technology is already there. There's amazing things going on. As you know, Facebook. When it first came out, people were like, oh, what a cute tool. You can actually talk with your friends. And look what happened. Revolutions happened. Because it was easy to use. Because people could connect. It's not because the technology was amazing. It's because it allowed people to connect and collaborate. So here we are, ground zero of the technology of the information world in San Francisco. My challenge to architects in the industry, how are we going to move into that? Because we're not there yet. We're just starting. We're just starting. So this is the beginning of a journey that we need to jump into. Because if we don't jump in, others will. Oh, wait a second. It's not will. Others already are. And we're going to lose that opportunity. So how do we do this? <clears throat> OK, so this is the exercise. Open up your smartphones and your, and your iPads, whatever you have. It's a very simple exercise. Everybody's going to create them today, even if you don't know how to use them. This is a web app. It doesn't matter what tool you use. And it's not, I'm not trying to demonstrate how great an app is. The message here really is that you put in your name, you put in your email address. That's optional, but if you want to put it in, that's great. You just choose a building, there's a pull down of a lot of buildings. And I'll explain this later. Choose building number one or number two. One is industrial tech, two is a medical building, a clinic. Choose what floor you're on. Pretend you're in that building and it's hot in your room. Choose the room you're in and then type at the bottom it's hot in here or the water's leaking or something like that and hit submit. This is kind of like a Twitter or a Facebook of your building talking to some database app. It doesn't matter what floor it is. <coughs> And I'll keep this uh, URL open through the rest of the slides here so you can actually come back to it. But if you submit this, we'll, we'll come back to this, to this result later. <clears throat> OK, a little bit about BIM storms. BIM storms, we started about four years ago. We had over 30. They're essentially a charrette on the web. And we have been using this process in our office since the 90s. But we decided to open it up to the industry, so other, other architects, other owners, other software companies to collaborate. It's a way to move the industry forward. I was very 
very frustrated at how things were not connecting, even though there's all these great tools out there, and there's all these great architects with great ideas, and we felt that if we don't connect, we, we tend to, this is another weakness that we have, we have a lot of strength as architects, we innovate and we think of things in our head, and we produce a result, but if we don't share what's in our head with others, again, you're not in the 21st century, you're closed in, you're not collaborating, and you're not showing your value. So BIM storms are a way to connect with others in the industry. <clears throat> this is one BIM storm, the first one, uh, several years ago, that Penn State uh, students were collaborating through their computers um, on a charrette design part of the city, like a city planning project. Uh, 400 buildings, 24 hours, we didn't expect it to be this big. 130 teams from around the world working in real time, just like in a charrette, bouncing ideas off of each other. Everybody has a different view on their screen. Uh, finding a site, finding a building, working on Facebook. This generation expects nothing less than this type of interactivity. If they come into an office today, they'll typically be shocked at how we're not there yet, which is a bad thing, but also a good thing because we can rapidly get there. <clears throat> this is from actually currently underway. It's been from Oklahoma City, University of Oklahoma, Oklahoma Planning Department. We're looking at issues about planning, design, and energy, and eco-district kind of an approach. We work on energy eco-district projects with this as well, too. This is a mashup. It's a mashup of Google Earth, ArcGIS server pulling in GIS maps of property lines and building footprints, and then BIM sitting on top of that in a web browser as people start making decisions in real time. You can actually join this for free. Now, we have a webinar on Monday, and the actual thing is happening next Friday. So you learn. BIM storms are a way to learn on how to, how to work and collaborate with others. <clears throat> A little discussion about tools and location. You are here, I'm in this room, I'm John, I'm on the third floor or whatever, I'm on this floor of the building, I'm in this part of the city, I'm in this part of the map. A lot of information at each level, each level of detail. If you look at it from another extreme angle, I can say I don't care about everything else that I want to know about where I am and my, my relationship steps. So you can take all that information and point to a place and say, here's what's going on in the building. In the reverse direction, it's called geographic information systems. A few years ago, people didn't even know what that is, but now everybody uses GIS. If you use a smartphone and have a map, it's a geographic information system. And it's all about location. If you know where you are, you can start having a discussion of how much energy, where am I, where's the closest supplier, et cetera, et cetera. So you could abstract that information all to a point on a map. You don't necessarily have to have a full-blown BIM to have a discussion about all the data in BIM. All the decisions you're trying to make about location and buildings and energy and costs and construction, etc. <clears throat> so, the talk today is about California community colleges. There's 2.4 million students okay. in California, um, hello, almost the population of Chicago. It's a city. 2.4 million students in California, and there's space. There, there could be more than that with the budgets and all that stuff. They start having constraints. There's a lot of challenges. They have 5,200 buildings in the state of California, existing buildings, new buildings coming online. They have 120,000 rooms. If you took each room and put it side by side, and we did this in a bin actually, with a stretch the length of California. So imagine the amount of data, it's immense, the amount of information about existing facilities. So what California has now, they have 24,000 acres of campus sites larger than in, in New York City. <clears throat> 72 million square feet would fit into 32 entire state buildings, existing facilities. Six billion dollars a year to run, billion construction in the last 10 years, more coming up. Energy is a huge issue. The challenge was, do we wait to have 5,200 BIMs before we have to start having a discussion about energy. You don't have to have a highly, even though can we do this as well, can we work with detailed BIMs for design, construction, all amazing stuff. You've seen all that, we're not going to go through that. But you don't have to wait for that level of detail to start <laughs> using BIM to, use, to manage energy. If we had to wait for all 5,200 BIMs to come online before we start managing energy, for example, the state would sink, right? So the state of California has a system called Fusion. They developed this in-house partner with other groups. And they've been using this for about 10 years. It's a tabular database of all of their facilities, how many laboratory space, how many square feet, what's the condition of the buildings. So BIM is not only about 
new building by the existing building. They also have GIS that shows where is the location. <coughs> they need to manage a lot of different data. They need to manage facility and budgets, and they had CAD, static CAD files, they had GIS that had maps of demographics and student shifts. Incredibly complex tasks of where do we spend money, how do we manage, how do we design new facilities, how do we get deliverables from architects that are using them, how do we get dashboards and look at buildings that are starting to have building automation systems that are broadcasting out, here's how much energy I'm using, now what do you want to do with that data, can you see it? Imagine an immense amount of data coming out of an existing building. No oh, thanks. <laughs> I talk fast, I'm sorry, it was kind of a fire hose approach. But. So, <clears throat> A lot of people think, well, the, the solution is to put it into one database. If we had one database, everything would be solved. If we had one tool, everything would be solved. That's kind of a gut reaction. Put everything in one tool, it's going to be solved. And absolutely not. It's not one database. It's a lot of databases. It's about getting about facilities, about this, about that. The other challenge is that we use a lot of great tools down here that do them, for example, engineering applications, facility management applications, business applications. And we're doing this kind of how do we export from one tool and import it to the other tool and keep things in sync? You don't do that on the internet. Delta doesn't export their Excel schedule every day and send it to Expedia and imports it into their schedule. They're broadcasting to each other. Here's my flight. Do you want to buy it? And here are the seats. And here's a floor plan of the plane as you buy the seats. The bins are being updated in real time. So if you take this, these tools and start broadcasting out to what are called model servers, the technology is already there. The internet already works like this. You broadcast out to two databases. <coughs> Those databases in the cloud start broadcasting out to what's called web services, and then you can have dashboards, <coughs> many applications, because there's many levels of users that need to access this information. They need to say, I don't need to be a BIM expert, but I want to know how much energy my building is using. Put it on my iPhone. If you can get on your iPhone today, find a Starbucks, find your friends, find a taxi, here's taxi, all that stuff, why can't we do that? With our building data, because our building data is trapped in the 18th century pretty much. We're still doing things as kind of a document centric approach. That's a technology challenge. The other challenge is that we tend to hold things tight. It's my design, I'm not going to share it. That type of approach does not work today. Things are completely shifting around. Imagine a few years ago when tablets were not around, you would never imagine where we are today. Think three or four or five years ahead. Where are you going to be in this environment? <clears throat> so, the California Community Colleges, here's what they did, and it's still in progress, and the message really here is, we want others to jump in, we want others to think like this and work like this. So we have their fusion system, which is a database bus facility, they, one, one solution we could have said is, we could have said, you have a lot of great data about 5,000 buildings, give us your data, we're going to import it into another system, we actually need parts of some here called a new system. What we didn't do is we said, okay, instead of exporting it out, you keep it in your database and we'll subscribe to it. That's exactly how Expedia does it, right? They subscribe to the Delta and American Airlines schedule. Therefore, you can see it on your iPhone or your Android. Same thing with GIS. So you start getting an ecosystem. It's basically an ecosystem of information, a modular thing that you can plug and play and plan for future expansion of it and plan for how you plug other tools into that, other tools and other other uh, groups that are working like this into that ecosystem to be able to start interacting, not only interacting with that data, but actually creating data. So one scenario, for example, Fusion defines the requirements for new laboratory building, new projects. Currently, the way most districts do it, they, they print out a stack of PDFs, they hand it to you, the architect, and here's our requirement for a new laboratory. And here's a, the lighting levels, and energy levels, and all that stuff. And then you digest that as text, and you give us back something document set. Where are we heading? We're already starting to do this in some projects. We're going to hand you a BIM. The BIM is going to come from their database or from the systems here. It's going to aggregate everything together and say, here's our requirements for building. The BIM, whatever that already has, whatever. Give it back to us as a BIM so we can plug it back into the system because as the owner, we don't want to digest that back and manually have to export it to other systems. Very important concept. <laughs> okay, one thing about one of the tools we use is system that we developed. As architects, we're architects and software developers. This was not an intentional thing that happened. It kind of happened by accident in the 90s. It kind of evolved into it. What I would like to say is that all of you are going to essentially become some kind of a software, like what Mario was talking about. You're going to start touching the tools more closely. You're not going to sit there and wait and say, well, we really need an app that does A, B, and C. 
high school kids are building apps today that are hitting Google Earth and this and this and creating some kind of an app that does a specific task that needs zero training. That's a challenge. You have to create tools that access information that needs zero training. Because the data is too complex. We don't, we don't have time to be trained on 50 or 100 different ways of doing things in a complex way. Simplicity is key. And we as architects are masters of taking complex data, boiling it down, and giving it back to the clients and here's your product. If we can deliver a product of a building, why can't we deliver the information of the building in the same way? We are the best position to do that in the information age, as long as we step into that role. <clears throat> so California Community College. Click on a map, there's a map, a dot on a map, click on a campus, open up the building, click the building, get into the building, get into the room of the building, and see equipment. It, it's a drill down. It depends on what you want to do. <clears throat> Another very important point, this is a, kind of the fire hose that I'll give you a lot of information, but no single user has to touch every part of the system and all the data. You can have a very focused view of, I want to submit a work order, I care less about maps or BIM or CAD or energy use item, the water's leaking from them, the ceiling above them. Come here and do something with that. So every user does not have to know all the tools. As long as you're collaborating, you're not in those silos, then you can start working across each other. And you don't have to recreate things like maps, because maps exist on the internet already. They're already freely available in many cases. You can use a map and put it into your application. <clears throat> so pretty exciting stuff if you think of it from that perspective. Um, I was going to show this slide, but I don't think we're going to have time to you can actually click on a room, open up an interface, see a camera of the room, see the lights that are on the room, see that how much energy is being used in the room, and turn off the lights. And the intent is not to say that you can go into every room and turn lights on and off. The message here is that buildings are starting to pop. They're saying, here's how much energy we're using, here's the lights that are on. And the interface is here, there's a lot, this is a mashup again, about four or five different applications that are talking together to be able to give you that kind of an approach. It's not all done, we don't have all 5,200 buildings, obviously, at this level of detail. But if we have that goal that we want to continually refine it to a point that we're able to do things like this, it's going to get there. And then give it, give it to me on an app application or tablet or whatever. Give me the interface that I'm interested in. I want to do classroom scheduling. A lot of different exciting things are happening with the data that should be coming from architects that are designing the building, architects and engineers. It should be. Because today it's not. Today we deliver our building, other teams come in and re-engineer what we have and put it in other facility management applications, for example. So if we leave the building when it's designed and constructed, we've lost that value moving forward. We want to, we'll, we'll see the dashboard live in a second here. Okay, so back to <clears throat> what you submitted. Maybe we could go live for a second here. How am I doing on time? I started early, right? Okay. All right, so Let's see what's going on live next. I'll go away from the PowerPoints for a second and just show you live. Okay, so this is the map of California. Uh, this is a Google map in the background, obviously. Uh, it's wrapped around it with uh, one of our tools, the Onuma system, that pulls the map. Each dot on a map is a campus. You click on a campus map, lists buildings. These are BIMs at a high level of detail. I don't have to download the BIM of each building. 5,200 buildings in BIM, imagine how long it would take if there were single files of design and construction model. So I'm a very specific user here that wants to get information about a campus and I want to look, look at a list of projects. So either you get it as a map or a list of projects or down to the site level. This was a BIM storm that we just finished yesterday in Orlando with the Construction Owners Association. Construction the owners are interested in things like this. How do we get to the information about our buildings? whether they're being planned and designed and constructed or after they're delivered. So we need to jump in there and say, we are the best to give you information about our buildings because we know what the building's about as architects, right? Um, so this is a campus map. The significant thing here is that this map is a mashup that says, give me the facility condition, this existing campus map. These color codes, this is our wrapper of the system. The background map is coming from Google. Google map, let's actually turn on the Google map here for a second. Um, the, the buildings are coming from our server. The building names and the room names are coming from the Fusion server. We don't own, the, it's called the authoritative source. Who owns the information about that Delta flight? It's not Expedia, Delta owns it. Expedia just presents it to you and does the transaction if you buying that flight. Same way here, build, this, the biggest challenge with a lot of owners is even tracking building names and numbers. So these numbers and names are actually coming from their server. 
the facility condition as teams are out on the site assessing buildings, the colors could change right in front of our eyes if they were out on site today, for example. Each of these has more data. You can keep on drilling into it. So for example, I can go into the floor plan. They were planning a new clinic. Here's a new clinic. We actually used the, um, the Veterans Affairs, Department of Veterans Affairs standards for space standards and injected it into this BIM storm. Here's the clinic, color-coded by different types. Notice that we keep things very simple. If you're, if it's the same data that would go into a design and construction model, but imagine it from a programming perspective, or now the building is completed perspective. The owner doesn't want to have to open up a Revit model or an ARCHICAD model to get down to, well, how many square feet of carpet do I have to do for janitorial services, for example. The source is, could be ARCHICAD or Revit, but it comes into a format like this. These can also be edited. So if I'm doing a renovation, you can say, okay, we want to actually move this room out. We're going to renovate it and pull this room out. So there's editing capabilities directly online. Simplicity and access to complex information from an owner's perspective allow you to start interacting with them with tools that are more familiar to them rather than having to have more complex uh, capabilities. Down to one room. These, this is an int interesting view. Notice there are just blocks here, but it says boiler, whatever. I don't necessarily have to have a detailed model that shows what a boiler looks like, but I can pull up a, a sensor here and say, show me the, the energy that's being drawn for this whole building for the last week, or the last day, or the last minute. It's a weekend, look at that. Power is low on the weekend. It's right now, there's not much power being drawn. Well, what happened in the last seven days? Now pulls, pulls the data. I don't even know where this is coming from. The source data, I don't really care. I just wanna see how much energy this building is using so I can start making decisions about what we do with that. What's the floor plan of this building? What lights are on Saturday? Oh, somebody left the lights on in the lobby and for some reason this restroom light's on. This is actually live right now. This is coming from this building saying lights are on in this building in a simple interface. Dashboard, I'm the owner, I wanna see, let's refresh it for a second because this is where the work orders are gonna come in. Your work orders that you submitted essentially are feeding into the database, are feeding into the model and color coding buildings and showing where work orders are coming in and the work orders, here we go right here. There's quite a few actually. Let's see, maybe I just want to get it as an email, it doesn't matter. Again, it's the, the, the message here is that you don't have to open the detailed model. Oh, there's actually a lot of them coming in. There's a lot of, a lot of work orders here. If I click open one work order, it shows me what was going on down here and builds up a floor plan and says somebody's requesting a room that's hot or cold or whatever. So that data feeds into the model, into the admin's view, or in the opposite direction, if I say, let's continue on with this right here. We had about 40 work orders come in from the owners the other day, yesterday actually. In the opposite direction, the same building in Navisworks in this case, that's showing me information about the building, but the data is coming from the Fusion server, from the Onuma server, from the work orders that are coming in, the work orders start popping up in Navisworks. So the message here is that the tools really don't matter. It's the data that matters, the information that matters. And you want to be able to get that information in any application you want, all the way from, I just want an email about this water leaking through the roof, to I don't know which pipe is being hit and, and affecting that part of the building. And you want the buildings to be talking to you. So the buildings get smarter and starting to say lights on or lights off. And those technology costs are going to go down. And you, as an architect, engineer, and planner, and actually help the owner to pull all this stuff together. This creates huge opportunities that, that we as designers and architects and engineers can use to help owners get to those goals, those, those what we call wicked problems, the wicked problems of the world as we all know. Very complex problems that were very difficult to solve before. Imagine if you could not make an airline reservation today on your smartphone. You would have to get that printed schedule of the flights, you know, 20, 15, 20 years ago, that's the way it was. You had to go to a travel agent or you had to go get a printed book that was outdated the minute it's printed. But now we want things at our fingertips, which the end result is it gives you more time for design. A lot of people look at this and they ask me, why did you build this as an architect? We did this starting in 93 because we wanted to automate the stuff that is not fun to do. So we could spend more time on design, on the hand sketching, on meeting people, on talking about great design. Because all of this stuff is just a wasted effort. If you're manually doing stuff, you have to be able to manage that information. And we talk about it as sustainability and knowledge about the environment. The information about your buildings, if they're not accessible, it's not sustainable because it's bad information or information that's not available that people are making decisions on that cause what we call train wreck. And we've all seen that, right? 
So um, BIM Storm Coa, if you go to the BIM Storm site, you'll see a lot of these BIM Storms. Is actually, they're actually happening a lot this week. There's the Oklahoma City, there's a the construction owners, BIM Storm that just finished yesterday in Orlando, but, but that's ongoing. There's a clinic, there's DOD medical healthcare standards and VA standards going in there. We're working with the National Institute of Building Science. We're, if anybody's interested about healthcare, let me know because we're, look, we're looking at the industry to find, to find uh, uh, tools and, and uh, teams that are working in healthcare as uh, use cases. This is the COA BIM Storm. Uh, I'm sorry, it's Oklahoma. It should be OKC. Or if you go to BIMstorm.com, you can actually join this Oklahoma BIM Storm. And to finish off, it's all about connecting. If you can connect you as an individual, it doesn't matter who you are, large, small company, it doesn't matter. If you're small, it's actually even better. It gives you more power through these, these types of processes to connect and to share. Big, huge thing. Don't hold on to your data. Don't be afraid of sharing. You might lose a little, but you're going to gain a lot. If you're not connected and you're not sharing, nobody knows you exist in one first century. Just think of Facebook. Yeah. Be friends and everybody else will like you. If you're not there, you're not part of this new ecosystem. The ecosystem of collaboration and sharing, are you in? Thank you very much.